I appreciate having the privilege of coming here and being able to, as we were, kick off these lectures with this introduction to the old school, new school thought. As I usually do in my classroom, let me read a passage of Scripture, and we'll have a word of prayer and then move forward into the lecture. 2 Timothy 3, or 1, 13. 2 Timothy 1, 13. We'll be talking about old school Presbyterianism, and it talked about subscription to standards. Hold the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee guard through the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in us. Let us ask God's blessing upon this time together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee for its instruction to us with regard to the matters of holding the pattern of sound words, holding the faith. And as we look at the history of American Presbyterianism, help us to see how this has been done in the past and help us to see how it should be applied to us in the present day. So bless us in this time together, and we ask it in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary affirms in its catalog among its distinctives, number one, belief in the plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture resulting in an inerrant word as it was originally given by God, and therefore the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Secondly, belief in the Reformed faith as set forth in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the larger and shorter catechisms. Full subscription to the whole of these standards is the position of the seminary. This was the position of old-school Presbyterian Church of the past century. As we enter into the discussions today, we shall be examining what is called old-school Presbyterianism as it relates to the Southern Presbyterians of this country. The term old-school Presbyterian is a technical term and is used to describe the conservative branch of Presbyterianism of the 19th century. Before we get into this, this discussion, it's important for us to make a distinction between the old school and the old side Presbyterians of the previous century. Though the new school Presbyterians of the last century and the liberal Presbyterians of this century have sought to make the identification of the two groups, I believe this is an error. The reason for this type of rewriting of history is to seek to justify the broadness of the modern church with the idea that loose subscription was allowed by the 1729 Adopting Act. David Hall has an excellent essay in the volume The Practice of Confessional Subscription, which he edited and was published in 1995, entitled Reexamining the Reexaminers of the Adopting Act. He points out that until recently, until relatively recently, the tradition of interpreting the meaning of the Adopting Act of 1729 was fairly uniform. The Adopting Act was not isolated, uh, being interpreted and reiterated on numerous occasions. After 1729, the intent was reaffirmed in every decade for over a century. And that's a remarkable fact. And I've been looking at that and seeing that as I've been working on this material, that it's true. That you have every decade they reaffirm this, the Adopting Act. Indeed, this is the single most reiterated and reaffirmed act of early American Presbyterianism. In his, in his essay, Hall points to this uh, Charles Augustus Briggs, who was found guilty of heresy by the General Assembly in 1892, as the one who began the undermining of this central defining act of American Presbyterianism. Hall observes one of the results of this was to place in question the binding adherence of, to the confession of faith. Another unfortunate byproduct of this tradition was the countenancing of ministers holding their credentials in a confessional church without necessarily adhering to all that the church maintained. Now, to talk about old side and new side division, let me go back and talk about that first so we can make this distinction. Beginning in uh, around 1734, there was a period of spiritual blessing called, in, called the Great Awakening, which was to last until around 1760. A number of Presbyterian and Reformed ministers were moving spirits in this awakening. 
Jake, Jacob Freeling Housing of the Dutch Reformed Church in Raritan, New Jersey, Jonathan Edwards in New England, Gilbert Tennant in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and George Whitfield were among the Calvinistic preachers of this period who contributed to this great awakening. The movement was not without its problems. Within Presbyterian circles, there was a sharp antagonism over the whole matter of revivals. The old side stood for, quote, high inflexible standards of education and rigid conservatism in forms of worship and methods of evangelism. The other, that is the new side, emphasized experimental piety and in worship permitted a wide latitude to emotionalism, end of quote. The Synod of Philadelphia stood as a bulwark of the old side, while the new side formed a new synod around the nucleus of the former Presbytery of New York. The schism began in 1741 with the exclusion of the Presbytery of New Brunswick from the Synod of Philadelphia. It was uh, consummated uh, in the forming of the Synod of New York in 1745. In other words, the Presbytery was excluded and walked out of that 1741 meeting, and then in 17, by 1745, the New York Brethren had joined them. During this period of the Great Awakening, there was a great deal of evangelistic work done by itinerant preachers. It was this work that laid the foundation for the First Presbytery in the Virginia, North Carolina area. Missionaries from both of the synods visited and labored in the South. From the Old Side Synod of Philadelphia, John Thompson and Hugh McAdden, are particularly notable. It was to the honor of the new side men, however, to lay the foundation for and to establish Hanover Presbytery, the mother presbytery of the South. William Robinson, in a short ministry, laid the seeds of Presbyterianism in eastern Virginia. Uh, they say that he had four days of preaching around Hanover, uh, Virginia, just north of Richmond, and those four days were so marked, uh, their effect was being felt long after that. He was followed by the great Samuel Davies, who had an extended ministry around Hanover, Virginia, and who became the father of the first Presbytery in Virginia, organized in 1755. At about this same time, with the defeat of Braddock at Fort Necessity in July 19, or 1755, a large number of the Scotch-Irish moved southward uh, through the Valley of Virginia into Carolina. Accompanying them was Alexander Craighead, a new sider, who became the first minister to settle in the area between the Atkin and Catawba rivers in North and South Carolina. This was to become the nucleus of that great center of Presbyterians that still exists in and around Charlotte, North Carolina. In 1758, two side, the two sides reunited, though there were still some differences to, uh, that continued to threaten the peace of the church in the north, those in the south seemed to have moved forward together without further difficulty. The differences had been over matters of experimental religion and not doctrinal. Thus, the two sides could reunite without any change of doctrinal standard from which they had, uh, which they had adopted in 1729. The basis of the un reunion reads th thus. Both synods, having approved and received the Westminster Confession of Faith and the larger and shorter catechisms as an orthodox and excellent system of Christian doctrine founded on the Word of God, we do still receive the same as the confession of our faith and also adhere to the plan of worship, government, and discipline contained in the Westminster Directory, strictly enjoined it, enjoining it on all our members and probationers for the minister, ministry that they preach and teach according to the form of sound words in said confession and catechisms, and avoid and oppose all errors contrary thereto. One of the questions still in the PCA is, what do you do with exceptions? They are uh, admittedly an error from, from our point of view. And what the uh, 1758 reunion said is that they are not allowed to teach any error even though we might allow them to stay in the ministry despite that error. That, and then continuing this, uh, uh, you, you know, this statement, that no presbytery shall license or ordain to the work of ministry any ca candidate until he declare his acceptance of the Westminster Confession and Catechisms as the confession of his faith and promise subjection to the Presbyterian plan of government in the Westminster Directory, end of quote. As I understand the old, new, old side, new side controversy of the 18th century, therefore, 
It was primarily a problem that grew out of the Great Awakening and the education of, of ministers. The old side men tended to resist the evangelistic zeal of those involved in the Great Awakening, while the new side men embraced it and entered into warm uh, evangelistic preaching. In their zeal to do this, on occasion they intruded into parishes of the old side ministers and even across presbytery lines without seeking permission to do so. And the result was a revival got started in these churches where the old side men were, and they didn't like it. The synod condemned this kind of intrusion as not being in a, according to good Presbyterian order, and it certainly was not. The new side men felt that this was pharisaical on the part of the old side men and refused to be limited even by ecclesiastical directives as to where they would preach the gospel. The other matter that brought about the division of 1741 was the issue of the education of the ministry. In 1727, William Tennant had begun his log college at Neshaminy, just north of, of Willow Grove in Pennsylvania. The product of this school and other academies that were molded after it were among the finest ministers of this period of American Presbyterianism. The old side men, all of whom had received their college training either in Scotland or Ireland or Harvard or Yale, were able to pass a resolution that required all ministerial candidates either to have received such an education or be subject to an examination by the Synod on their academic knowledge as candidates for the ministry. The new side men saw this as an attack on the log college and their academies, and thus refused to abide by the action of the Synod. The Presbytery of New Brunswick proceeded to the ordination of one of their candidates without submitting to the synodical uh, examination. With the condemnation of this action, the members of that Presbytery withdrew from the Synod, eventually New York, Presbytery also joined them. In their forming of this new synod, they readopted the Westminster Standards without any indication of a loosening of the subscription requirements. When these two groups reunited in 1758, the adoption was again reaffirmed, as we've just read. The issue of the old side, new side controversy was not one of subscription or a doctrinal difference, but of methodology and good order. The issue of the old school, new school differences of the next century was much more a doctrinal issue and did hang upon the subscription to the standards. The plan of union, the old school and new school controversy arose directly from the adoption of the plan of union of 1801. In order to have some understanding of this particular uh, history of the Presbyterian Church uh, of America at the end of the 18th in the beginning of the 19th century, it's well to be reminded that the colonies had finally won their war for independence, that the Constitutional Convention was held in Philadelphia in 1789 at the same time the church was coming to its first general assembly. The confession and the larger catechism had been modified to remove the parts which, that were uniformly taken, to which the, the exception had been uniformly taken in 1729 and uh, suggesting the power of the civil magistrate over the church. For the first time, then, the Presbyterian Church had a Book of Church order, having previously operated under uh, part of its collections, which was a collection of actions of the Church of Scotland pertaining to Presbyterian congregational life. Thus, the newly organized, reorganized Church was just beginning to operate under its own constitution. In his history of the new school, Samuel Baird uh, brings out the fact that there was a Presbyterian element in the New England congregationalism that was never able to gain ascendancy. In particular, the Connecticut churches viewed themselves as essentially Presbyterian, though they did not break with the congregations, Congregationalists over the polity. The result was that there was a felt affinity for the Presbyterian church on the part of many New Englanders. Thus, as the new Western territories were being opened in Western New York and Ohio following the American War for Independence, a proposal was made to allow for the Presbyterian and Congregationalists to join, jointly establish churches and have free interchange between the two bodies. The result was the so-called Plan of Union with the Association of Connecticut, which was adopted in 1881. The preface reads, Regulations re adopted by the General Assembly of Presbyterian Church in America and by the General Association of the State of Connecticut with a view to prevent alienation and promote union and harmony in those new settlements which are uh, composed of inhabitants from these bodies. All would agree that this was a good purpose, but as, to, as we look at the regulations themselves, we see that it involved 
a compromising of the biblical teachings on polity. Plan only has four uh, paragraphs, but let me just read the one that's the, the most obviously uh, difficulty. Fourth, if a congregation consists partly of those who are both congregational form of discipline and partly of those who hold the Presbyterian form, we recommend to both parties that this be no obstruction to their uniting in one church and settling a minister, and that in this case the church choose a standing committee from the communicants of the said church whose business it shall be to call to account every member of the church who shall conduct himself inconsistently with the laws of Christianity and to give judgment on such conduct. Now, notice that doesn't even limit it to being only male members. I don't think there would have been any uh, women involved in such a standing committee at that time, but it isn't even specified that it has to be the male members only. That if a person uh, condemned by their judgment by be a Presbyterian, he shall have a liberty to appeal to the Presbytery. If he be a Congregationalist, he shall have a liberty to appeal to the body of male communicants of the church. And there they were aware, you see, that you had to have male communicants at least with, with regard to uh, this matter and in, uh, in the, an appeal. In the fore case, the determination of the Presbytery shall be final unless the church shall consent to the further appeal to the Synod or to the General Assembly. Church has the final say as to whether you're going to appeal it or not, not the, the Presbytery or the Assembly. And in the latter case, the Congregationalist case, if the party condemned shall wish for a trial by mutual counsel, the cause shall be referred to such a counsel, and providing the standing committee of any church shall de uh, depute one of uh, their, themselves to attend Presbytery, he may have the same right to sit and act in Presbytery as a ruling elder of the Presbyterian Church. That's the end of that plan of union quotation. That this was a well-intended plan is generally conceded, but it certainly involved a compromise of principles upon which the Presbyterian Church was based. For example, in churches composed of both Congregationalists and Presbyterians, the bi biblical office of elder, which both the Saybrook Platform of Connecticut and the Presbyterian Form of gov Government demanded, was set aside for a stand standing committee of persons who were subjected to no examination, made no pledge or subscription, either to the confession or its form of government. They were not called uh, or tried or ordained to office in the church, and yet they were empowered to sit as the sole judges in all cases arising in the ch church. Further, they were authorized to send delegates to the presbyteries to, with the power to sit and act on all questions that might come before that body without any subscription necessarily required. Baird's analysis of the reason that the assembly could adopt such regulations that was so contrary to the constitution of the Presbyterian Church is as follows, quote, for the fathers of our church, having so recently been accustomed to see the general synod exercise powers unrestricted by a constitution, were not yet able to realize that the general assembly was bound to conform to the provisions of the constitution, which the church uh, through the General Synod had established for her own protection and ordering of all her courts higher and lower. And I can remember in the beginning of the PCA uh, that they would ask sometimes, ask me as the state clerk, can't we go against the Book of Church Order at that point? No, we're a constitutional church. But there would be, even today, those who would say, well, if the Constitution doesn't matter, we can go against it. Baird goes on to comment as follows. The imprudence of allowing such a breach in the walls as that involved in the plan of union might have been expected to arrest a more prompt attention and secure its rejection. But the assembly was seduced by the siren of union and peace. The plan was adopted in the way thus prepared for corruption or corrupting the doctrines of the church, the utter defacing of her order, and the introduction of protracted controversy, strife, and final schism. B.M. Palmer, the first moderator of the Southern Presbyterian General Assembly, also had a pertinent warning for us uh, to consider whenever we may be tempted to compromise by our principles for what may appear to be a good goal. Quote, history does not afford a better illustration of the evil wrought by good men whenever from motives of policy they swerve from principle. Their virtue leads, lends a sanction to their their schemes, while it does not stop the fatal results. This agreement was not only established by good men, but it originated in the sweetness of most godly intentions. 
What more Christian object could be proposed than to facilitate union between these discordant elements, Presbyterian and Congregation? Unfortunately, this was not attempted by a process of natural fusion and giving way and confirming to one to the other a circumstance, uh, as circumstance might dictate, but by an artificial convention making a composite of both, end of quote. The plan as it was put into effect. The result of the plan of union was the development in western New York and Ohio of a number of churches which were of mixed character allowed by the, uh, the plan. Once established, these remained even when the population had grown to the point where both Presbyterian and Congregational churches could have been established side by side. There should have been some natural way to have moved from this temporary measure back to the standard ecclesiastical polity. The fact is that this plan remained intact until abrogated by the Assembly in 1837. The result was establishment of churches, presbyteries, and even synods on the basis of the plan instead of the constitutional provisions of Presbyterian polity. Under the plan, committee men who had never given up any pledge to adherence to any symbol of the faith were admitted to function in the eldership of the Presbyterian Church. Departures particularly in polity. Before uh, tracing the, how the church developed under the plan of union, we should first note the other influences of congregationalism on the Presbyterian church at this time. Barrett says, The great controversy, the history of which we as here trace, concerned not only the doctrinal purity of the church and the maintenance of divine order of God's house, it also involved the evangel evan evangelic office of the church itself. Her right and duty with her own hands to minister to the wants of the needy and to carry the gospel of salvation to the perishing world, end of quote. The Presbyterians, as they had first organized, saw the general presbytery itself as the mission's agency. It sent out missionaries to establish churches through uh, the growing colonies. As the presbyteries multiplied and the synod was formed, the presbyteries continued to be active in sending missionaries into destitute areas. We've already seen this in connection with both the old side and new side presbyteries that sent men to the south. The Synod of Pittsburgh in 1802 called itself the Western Missionary Society and appointed a board to supervise the sending of missionaries to the Indians of the area. The Synod of the Carolinas began a similar mission to the Indians, creating a commission to attend to this business. In 1802, the General Assembly, which had been handling the business of missions directly, appointed a standing committee on missions that was renewed each year. This committee was designated a Board of Missions in 1816 with a whole business of missions assigned to it subject to annual review and control of the assembly. In 1805, the Reverend Ashbel Green proposed that there be a committee, assembly committee on education of candidates for the ministry. One of the results of this request was the establishment of the assembly seminary at Princeton in 1812. With the concurrent development at this time of the Hopkinsonian doctrines in New England, there was a dissatisfaction with Princeton, and thus in 1815, just three years after Princeton started, the American Education Society was organized in Boston. This society was vigorous in seeking to control education in the Presbyterian Church. With efforts of the Assembly to establish the Board of Education in 1818, a parallel new school society was established in New York which refused to cooperate in the erection of an assembly board. The design of the New York board was to direct candidates for the ministry to New England seminaries and not to Princeton. In the meanwhile, Auburn Seminary was found, formed to propagate the New England theology. The seeds of this thought were introduced into East Tennessee by Reverend Hezekiah Balsh. And though condemned by the assembly in 1798, he, he had continued to propagate his views as president of Greenville, that's Greenville, Tennessee College. In, in, and in 1819, the Synod of Tennessee determined to found a seminary under the leadership of the Reverend Gideon Blackburn, who was also a new, who held the New School of Theology. A board of foreign missions was formed with the Dutch Reformed Church and the Associate Reformed Churches in 1817. An independent board called the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missionaries, well, Foreign Missions, which was a voluntary society, operated in the direct competition with the Presbytery or Assemblies Board. Eventually, the Presbyterian Church merged its board with the ABCFM, thus losing any church-controlled agency for foreign missions. 
She simply gave gave over and uh, did no longer have a, an agency for foreign missions herself. From this brief survey, it can be seen that voluntary societies were carrying on much of the work that belonged to the church as the church. In fact, the church had abandoned its privilege and responsibility in the area of foreign missions. Its work of education was being undermined by the voluntary societies who refused to cooperate with the assembly, assemblies education program due to the differences in theology. So the whole idea of parachurch agencies, independent church agencies, or in independent agencies, not church agencies, doing the work of the church is, was a very much established at that time in American ecclesiastical life and still is one of the problems that we face today. Now, the church that developed under this, I've already alluded to, you have presbyteries and synods uh, that uh, and they eventually controlled uh, the the assembly by 1831. The majority of the assembly were new school people control, and they controlled the assembly uh, uh, through 1836. The South, which was not largely affected by the new school thought, except in East Tennessee, became aroused and rallied to the to send commissioners to the 1837 assembly. Very briefly, they, the 1836 assembly had endorsed Albert Barnes's commentary on the book of Romans, which was clearly opposed to the Westminster standards. And uh, with that, then the Southerners began to recognize this thing is going to affect all of us. It's not just something that's up there uh, in, in New England or in, in the Middle West, but it's affecting all of us. Now, the doctrinal divisions of, of the New England theology. Despite the fact of this breakdown of Presbyterian order and polity, the more important matter of concern was the fact that New England theology there had, had arisen in, a, in, in New England, a th new theology had arisen, which was no longer true to the Reformed faith of the Westminster Standards. Dr. B.M. Palmer, in his biography of Thornwell, devotes a chapter th to the old school, new school split. He observes, in the history of the, ch of the church, laxity in doctrine is always sure to accompany contempt of discipline and order. That's a thing I think, again, we need to remember. Laxity of doctrine will accompany uh, laxity or, or contempt for discipline and order. He further asserts regarding the new school, old school, new school controversy. The cardinal issue in the whole dispute was that of strict or lax construction of the acknowledged standards. Since all the deviation from sound doctrine claimed to be salva fide, and therefore within the limits of the confessional faith of faith and the authority of the form of government, well, I was held not to be infringed on in the practical administration of church affairs. The evidence, however, is cumulative that up to the beginning of the present, the 19th century, through a period of nearly 100 years, no subscription to the Westminster Confession was tolerated, which did not accept it in its entirety. The ingenious artifice of receiving it only for substance of doctrine was the invention of a later and more degenerate age. That's Palmer's evaluation of it. He then proceeds to set forth his proofs of this statement. And I will just re review very quickly. First, he said the Adopting Act of 1729, a formal judicial uh, promulgation of these standards to be necessary test of orthodoxy. Second, after agitation about this, the Synod in 1736 says, the Synod has, doth declare that the Synod have adopted and still do adhere to the Westminster Confession Catechisms and Directory without the least variation or alteration and without any regard to said distinctions alluding to the certain expressions in the preliminary act of the adopting act, preliminary act to the adopting act. Third, the enforcement of strict subscription on all entrants into the ministry. The Synod in 1730 passed the following whereas some persons have been dissatisfied at the member, uh, manner of wording of last year's agreement about the confessions, supposing some expressions not sufficiently obligatory upon entrance. The Synod do now declare that they understood these clauses that respect the admission of entrants or candidates in such a sense as to oblige them to receive and adopt the confession and catechisms at their admission in the same manner and as fully as the members of the Synod did that were then present." Synod made it mandatory that the Synod inquire each presbytery man annually to, to as to their compliance. And Hodge says this, there is not the slightest evidence of any presbyteries ever ad ad admitted uh, during this period under review of any minister who uh, descended 
from any of the doctrinal articles of the Confession of Faith. Fourth, uh, this is still uh, um, Palmer's proof of his position. Language used in the regard to the adopting form of government is in contrast to the used in, that used in the adoption of the Confession. Quote, the Synod do unanimously acknowledge and declare that, that, that they judge the directory for worship, discipline, and government of the Church commonly annexed to the Westminster Confession to be agreeable in substance to the Word of God and founded thereon. Uh, in, and, end of quote. In 1786, the Synod explained its language regarding the form of government. The Synod also receives the directory for public worship and form of government recommended for the Westminster, by the Westminster Assembly as in substance agreeable to the institution of the new, new institutions of the New Testament. This mode of adoption we use because we believe the general platform of our government be, to be agreeable to the sacred scriptures, but we do not believe that God has been pleased to reveal and enjoin every minute circumstance of the ecclesiastical government and discipline as not to leave room for Orthodox churches of, of Christ in these minutia to differ with charity from one another. And that's the end of their quote. Palmer observes, Here then, for the first time in our ecclesiastical annals, we meet with the relaxed phrase, quote, agreeable for substance, end quote, which a later period sought to carry over into the confession of faith, but which is employed by these fathers, and this is as late as 1786, which was employed by these fathers expressly to discriminate betwixt the two, in regard to the confession, the subscription was explicit and particular. It's not received for substance, but in all its articles, with specific exception, whereas a with a specified exception, whereas a latitude is allowed to the adoption of form of government is being comprehensively embraced only in its general principles. Palmer's fifth point. If there had been a disposition to abate the authority of the confession, it would have been most natural that the division of 1741 would have revealed it. The fact is that both the old and new sides reaffirmed their subscription to the standards. Again, in 1758, the first act it was to reaffirm the adoption of the standards. Again, in 1789, the first assembly was formed. The confession as amended was declared to be part of the constitution of the church. As Hodge says, who ever heard of adopting a constitution for substance? Is the constitution of the United States thus adopted or interpreted? It is, on the contrary, the supreme law of the land, and all who take office under it are bound to observe it in all its parts. That's the end of quote from Hodge. Trinerud, uh, Leonard Trinerud, who wrote in the, in the 1950s, I believe, um, in his Making of an American Tradition, argues that the New Side was really a loose subscriptionist group. He follows charge, Charles Augustus Briggs in this line of argument. Briggs and Trenderud would both favor looser views themselves, in other words, they had an agenda, and thus seek to buttress their position by aligning the New Side with them. It's interesting to men that the men of that generation did not take the position alleged by Trenderud but were satisfied with the subscription of 1729. We've already alluded to David Hall's answering of Briggs and Trinerud in his article on re-examining the re-examiners. And then Palmer also makes a sixth point. The judicial cases from 1763 to 1810 show a rigid application of the confession in repression of error. Palmer concludes that his summary of proofs with remarks that are applicable to every age Quote, it is important as justifying the measures by which after a temporary departure she has reformed back to her original orthodoxy, and because the attempt will be renewed from age to age to escape from the obligation of an extended creed by an ambiguous subscription to its articles. And so he's warning that every age there will be the effort to break away from such an extended subscription as we have in the Presbyterian Church to the Westminster Standard. Now, just briefly, the results of this and Presbyterian controversy in the South. The Presbyterians in the South only gradually became involved in the conflict. It appears that some leaders, such as John Holt Rice, hoped to steer a middle course between the old and new schools. This may account for the fact that when the division later came to pass, that there were some Southern groups that separated not for theological reasons, but out of sympathy 
with the new school people when they had been mis uh, whom they thought they had been mistreated by the old school. Uh, in Mississippi, the Presbyterian split right down the middle. And the reason was not doctrinal. Even, even uh, uh, Trice Thompson says that it was not doctrinal. Mississippians were conservative in their theology. It was fear of a strong central power. And the new school in Mississippi uh, withdrew, pri or the new school group withdrew primarily over that uh, issue. By the way, we lost Mississippi College at that time. That was a Presbyterian college. It's now the largest Baptist college in Mississippi, but it had been a Presbyterian college. William Henry Foote wrote in 1850 concerning the church in the South uh, in the early 1830s. As yet, the Southern clergy had taken little or no part in the vehement discussions carried on in the Northern and Eastern Presbyteries about the nature and the extent of atonement, the ability and inability of man, natural and moral, the nature of sin and imputation, the origin of revivals, uh, viewed as metaphysical subjects and argued upon as such rather than gospel truths. On these subjects as doctrines taught in the Bible with clearness and definiteness sufficient for salvation as well expressed in the confession, the Southern ministers preached often and plainly and powerfully. They just didn't get into the debates. They continued to preach the Bible on those matters. Now you have in 1834 an act and testimony that the old school men were able to pa pass or did adopt, and they pr presented it to the assembly. Uh, we do bear our solemn testimony against the right claimed by many of interpreting the doctrines of our standards in a sense different from the sense of the church for years past, while they continue in our communion on the contrary. We aver that they who adopt our standards are bound to candor and simplest integrity, to hold in their obvious accepted sense. Secondly, we testify against the unchristian subterfuge to which some have recourse when they avow a general adherence to our standards as a system, while they deny doctrines essential to the system or bold doctrines or hold doctrines as at complete variance with the system. And third, we testify against the reprehensible conduct of those in our communion who hold and preach and publish Arminian and Pelagian heresies, professing at the same time to embrace our creed and, and pretending that these errors do consist. Uh, profess to approve and adopt our doctrine and order, do nonetheless speak and publish in terms uh, or by necessary implication that which is derogatory to both and which tends to being, uh, to be, being both bring both into this repute. So that testimony of the old school people in 1834, now they were not able to carry the day at that time, but by 1837 they were able to rally. It was largely because the Southerners rallied into this that you have them actually carrying the, the uh, act of uh, disannulling or annulling the, the plan of union. Now, they have 16 points. I don't have time to read those, but 16 points of doctrine. Let me read just a couple of them. Uh, that they, then These are doctrines they were condemning the new school held. That we have no more to do with the first sin of Adam than with the, first, with the sin of any other parent. That infants come into the world free from moral uh, defilement, as, with, as was Adam when he was created. Uh, that uh, original sin does not include a sinful bias of the human mind. That the doctrine of the imputation, whether of the guilt of Adam's sin or of the righteousness of Christ, has no foundation in the word of God, is both unjust and absurd. That the sufferings and death of Christ were not only not truly vicarious and penal, but symbolic, governmental, and instructive only. Uh, so you can see they were st striking, at, le at least the old school men judged that, this, that some of the new school doctrines were striking at the very heart of the gospel. That Christ does not intercede for the elect until after they are regenerate. And that uh, regeneration is the act of the sinner himself, and that it consists in the change of his governing purpose he himself must produce. And so today you have evangelists saying you must be born again, and this is what you do to be born again. So that would be along with the new school of thought. The ch uh, church uh, put the dis determined to exclude all those churches and presbyteries and synods that had been formed under the plan of union. They declared it to be unconstitutional in 1837, and they cut out about 40 percent of the church at that time. And they won the day in the civil courts on their property uh, decisions, etc. And so from 1837 on, you had two ch churches, old and new school churches.
Now, the relations again in the South. Before moving to the relation of Southern Presbyterian Church to the Old and New School controversy, let's consider the state of the church at the time. William Henry Foote, who was a contemporary of this period and who has left valuable material in the history of the church, both in Virginia and North Carolina, comments on the general state of the, of the church at the time. There was a general spirit of unanimity prevailed throughout the Southern Presbyterians upon very many important subjects. There had been a purity of doctrine and forbearance among themselves and towards brethren, brethren at a distance who seemed to differ materially from their, their Southern brethren. The men that had, give, had given tone to the Southern Church were eminent for their adherence to the doctrines of the confession of faith and equally so for their charity among themselves. As John Neville likes to speak about this, there's a, there's a Carolina flavor, as he speaks of it, of Presbyterianism that he hopes that Greenville Seminary will be propagating, a, a willingness to listen to hear the other brother, but still hold firmly to the faith, hold it graciously. It's quite significant to see that Foote insisted that there was a general agreement in the South regarding confessional subscription. On the subject of creeds and confessions, he says, all were united in maintaining the necess this, their necessity as bonds of union and as an honest exposition to the public of these bonds drawn out in precise, well-arranged words. End of quote. That foot was uh, correct in his statement as seen in the fact that by far the largest portion of the Southern Presbyterians remained in the old school uh, group in the split of 1837. In general, the Southern Presbyterians did not enter into the old school conflict uh, which had uh, been raging in the North by 1832. As yet, the Southern clergy had taken a little or no time, no part in the vehement discussions carried out in the Northern Presbyteries. Uh, it was as the Barnes case that came about that they determined that they had to get involved. Now, one of the things that's striking to see, the man who became the chairman and moderator of that old school group was uh, George Addison Baxter, who had been taught by William Graham at Lexington, Virginia, as had Archibald Alexander of Princeton been taught by William Graham. William Graham's a, a striking figure, well worth study, has not been dealt with fully, uh, because he taught about four or five of the systematic theologians, both in Virginia and at Princeton. Uh, but uh, George Addison Baxter became the leader of the old school group in the 1837 assembly. Until the action of the assembly in 1836, Baxter had contended that the expressions used by the New School in is setting forth their theological opinions were capable of a construction harmonizing with the confession as understood in Virginia, not the, according to their repeated demand to be so interpreted. The resolutions in the case of Mr. Barnes caused him to abandon that ground, and he was prepared to go with the old school in their theology, accepting that he feared that it might be, be leaning to... Uh, uh, of some, to, in some brethren to an antinomian tenet. Not only was Baxter now stirred up, but the whole rest of the Senate of, the, of Virginia, who, who on the November the 7th, 1836 at Petersburg, unanimously adopted an act in which they set forth their convictions as to the ills facing the church and confessional teaching regarding the leading doctrines in question. Uh, and I have quotes from that. We don't have time to read that, but they talk about the various different doctrines that uh, are th dealt with. Regeneration, which we read one of those just a moment ago. Uh, justification, the doctrine of justification, the ability of the sinner to bring himself to God, uh, and so forth. It's very interesting that that statement was signed by George Addison Baxter, who was believed to be the primary author. William Hill. William Hill was pastor at Winchester, Virginia, and became the leader of the new school after the split took place the next year. But what I maintain is that, is that William Hill was orthodox in his doctrine. He didn't like the heavy-handed action of the 1837 uh, assembly, 1837 assembly, but William Hill, I think, was perfectly orthodox in his doctrine. Uh, that this was adopted w uh, unanimously by the Senator of Virginia, this, this paper uh, uh, warning against these def uh, defections. Uh, then with regard to Union Seminary, Senate of North Carolina is the body that insisted Union Seminary become old school and be clearly old school, whereas the Senate of North Carolina has by a large majority voted to sustain measures which were adopted by the last General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. Uh, this is after the 1837 Assembly. 
uh, believing them to be happily calculated to restore purity and peace to our churches, resolved, one, that in order to secure the confidence of this, of this synod and its cordial cooperation in building up and sustaining Union Theological Seminary, it is very desirable and important that the sentiments of the professors in the seminary should, in, in, should, in relation to the aforesaid, harmonize with those of the, his synod and its presbyteries, this synod and its presbyteries, in sustaining the action. Secondly, but should any a professor on examination of the subject arrive at the conclusion they cannot consistently, with their views of the truth and duty, concur with the assembly and the measures of reform which were adopted, Synod will not deem it necessary or expedient for such professors on that account to dissolve their connection with said seminary, provided they can with a good conscience refrain from all attempts to exert over our churches and over the minds of their theological pupils an influence tending to contravene, to contravene the decisions of the General Assembly and this Synod. And you had several faculty members leave the uh, seminary over that, by, but the Assembly then was actually then being called to be, to be clearly on side of the old uh, school. Uh, this, that this board cordially approved the above resolutions of the Synod of North Carolina. This is the Synod a Board of the Directors of the Seminary, and hereby adopt them as of expressing their own sentiments. This settled the matter. Union Seminary was to be an old school seminary. The result was the resignation of two members of the faculty who had, outs who had been outspoken in their criticism of the 1837, in and in particular, of their colleague Baxter. Uh, you have similar actions with regard to uh, Columbia Seminary, that the uh, Carolina, uh, Senate of Carolina also took such an action, and the, though Columbia Seminary had been much more influenced by New England thinkers, because it's very interesting, Thornwell had gone to New England for study, also... Uh, the, uh, the man who, who wrote the history of, of Presbyterians in, the, in South Carolina, uh, he had studied in New England. There was an affinity with, of South Carolina with New England that you wouldn't think would be there, especially since the war between the states. But earlier, a good many people had settled into South Carolina out of New England. And uh, this was one of the reasons that they tended to look that way, but that they uh, ended up uh, being old school with regard to the seminary. Now, George Marsden, and we don't have time to get into his analysis particularly, he points out and he feels that the Bible Presbyterian Church and the RPCES that joined the PCA really is part of that main heritage is a descendant of the New School. And that's interesting to see. I would maintain that way may well be the case, but that also liberalism of the Charles Augustus Briggs type comes out of the new school. And that, in other words, you have deviation from solid, sound Presbyterianism and Reformed theology of the Westminster Standards, and you have either going to fundamentalism type of thing that, that the Bible Presbyterians at least at first seem to hold, or you have going off to the left in the opposite direction, uh, the Briggs and the radical liberalism that resulted of the Briggs, from the Briggs case of Union Seminary separating from the uh, Presbyterian Church and so forth. Now, the um, Southern Presbyterian Church, I think we should see, see this. The Southern Presbyterian Church, following the uh, division, continued to be primarily old school. You had small groups in the South that were new school. In 1864, I believe it was, that they finally re-emerged. And here, it, rather interestingly, and I have it in my doctoral dissertation, the debate with Daphne and actually calling him in question as to his theological position in which he had chaired a committee for the union of the old and new school, new sides, new school in the South. And he, what Dabney wanted to do is to, to bring these people back into the old school church and, and suppress their voice. And, and Palmer really objected to this and didn't think it was good and then accused him of deviating from sound theology, which Dabney protested before the assembly that he was not doing. But uh, after... That union, which has been basically on old school terms, the Northern Church rejoined in 1869, and the Southern Church, in response to invitations to enter into union in 1870, said both wings, or the reunion shall be, uh, uh, excuse me, the both wings of the now united assembly, old and new school assemblies being united in 1869 in the North, during their separate existence before the fusion, did fatally complicate themselves 
with the state in political utterances deliberately pronounced year after year in which in our judgment were a sad betrayal of the cause of the kingdom and of our common Lord and head. We believe it to be solemnly incumbent upon the northern church, not with reference to us, but before the Christian world and before our divine master and king to purge itself of this error. Uh, so they refused uh, to, uh, they wanted the, the northern church to admit that they had been involved in political uh, actions and so forth. And then they described the union. The union now consummated between the old and new school assemblies north was accomplished by methods which, in our judgment, involve a total surrender of all the great testimonies of the church for the fundamental doctrines of grace at time when the victory of the truth over error hung long in the balance. The United Assembly stands of necessity upon a la an allowed latitude of interpretation of standards and must come at length to embrace nearly all shades of doctrinal belief. Isn't that prophetic? That's exactly what happened in the Northern Church. Of those failing or falling testimonies, we, Southern Presbyterians, are now the sole surviving heir which we must lift from the dust and bear to the generations after us. If, we would be uh, if it would be a serious compromise of this sacred trust to enter into public and official fellowship with those repudiating these testimonies, and to do this expressly upon the ground as stated in the preamble of the, to the overture before us, that the terms of reunion between the two branches of the Presbyterian Church of the North now happily consummated, consummated present an auspicious opportunity for adjustment of such relations. To found such correspondence professedly upon this idea would be to endorse that which we thoroughly disapprove. The uh, Northern Church never responded to that, but that was the position of the Southern Church. She saw herself clearly as an old-school church, and essentially it is my thesis that that's what we were seeking to do as we formed the PCA. We called ourselves Continuing Presbyterian Church, and what were we talking about? Not continuing the Southern Presbyterian Church as it was in the 1960s or the 1940s or the 1930s, but of the 1860s and 70s and 80s, the old-school Presbyterian Church.